RMC is supported by MonsterJoysticks.com. Level up your retro gaming with their joysticks featuring genuine Sanwar arcade parts. And OneClickPrint.com for your photos on canvas, acrylic, gifts and more. Local craftsmen and global delivery. Hello cave dwellers, it's time to learn about and give some TLC to yet another veteran micro. And this time it's one that's particularly interesting, or at least it is to me, because I, like many other people of my age from the UK, were very much a part of the whole story. This is the BBC Micro from the very same British Broadcasting Corporation who grace our TV and radios, and it's best remembered as the machine we had in our school classrooms in the 80s, whether it be a posh school with lots of them, or a less affluent one with one machine per year that you had to fight over with your friends, or at least that was my experience of it at the time. Today our goal is to get familiar with what's inside it, learn about its origins and consider basic maintenance and upgrades that you might want to do should you want to add one to your own collection. Throughout the series we will then perform that maintenance and any repairs that we come across that need doing and by the end of it I hope we'll all have learnt a little bit more and we'll have a nice example to add to the cave. As this is a machine that's so very steeped in history I think we should start by hearing about just why the BBC put their name to a microcomputer in 1981. Every machine has an origin story, and this one is particularly interesting. On the 1st of December 1981, the British Broadcasting Corporation Microcomputer System, or BBC Micro, was launched. Nine computer models with a BBC badge were produced over a 13-year period through to 1994, but when we say BBC Micro, we're talking about the first four BBC branded models. And those are the Model A, Model B, B plus 64 and the B plus 128. The subsequent BBC branded Master and Master Compact were the successor to the Micro and further BBC branded machines fall under the later Archimedes computer range. The initial models then are the Model A and Model B and that's the focus of our attention through this series. It was designed and produced by British computer outfit Acorn Computers and it was the result of a bidding process to produce a computer to support what was called the Computer Literacy Project. This project consisted of over 100 TV and radio programs, books, software and of course a computer and peripheral with which to try out these lessons which were relayed across all of those formats and it was hugely successful. Key to its success was the adoption of the project by schools, particularly primary schools of which 85% in the UK got involved, helped largely by government subsidies when purchasing them and over one and a half million BBC micros would be sold in total. The story though is much larger than the machine itself. It wasn't just primary school kids who were set to benefit from the project. At the end of the 1970s, a national conversation needed to be had on the future of technology and the place of everyone in that future. A conversation which feels as relevant today as it was in this 1978 episode of BBC's Horizon. You know, not only are we behind in Britain, I think in, in many areas in, in, the, in the technology itself, but also we're very far behind in government response to the technology right. and the changes. That I mean, was really my the governments, the governments right. of the US, Japan, mm. Germany, to some extent France, have been a little bit more timely Unless we develop a strategy, not just for an industry or a sector, but for Britain, um, worked out by an extra governmental body with a lot longer viewpoint than most governments have, yeah. I think we're going to have a lot of problems and, and fall in the middle. To add weight to this feeling, a six-part ITV documentary series named The Mighty Micro aired in 1979, in which Dr Christopher Evans of the UK National Physical Laboratory predicted a coming micro-revolution. So influential was the series that questions were raised in Parliament about it. We've embarked on a wild adventure. We really have. And nobody knows where all of this is going to lead. And in a sense, nobody's in control. In, in a sense, the technology is, is leading us. And we don't know where it's leading us. All that we can sensibly speculate about today is what's going to happen in the next 10 or 15 years. But for goodness sake, where, where on earth is it going to be by the the time we are old or by the time our children are old. I've got a three-year-old daughter and I think, you know, what's it going to be like when she's my age? And I really believe we've got the capability today to build a much better world for her than, than people are living in today.
it was in this climate then that the British government decided action was needed to equip the nation's current and future workforce with relevant and competitive skills. The 1970s were far from our country's finest hour. It was a decade of economic and political difficulty in the UK which comprised of an energy crisis, a financial crash and an international monetary fund bailout as inflation soared to 30%. During this turmoil, other nations were leaving us behind in the technological revolution. The government knew they needed to do something, but they just weren't sure what. The questions raised in Parliament indicated that they needed to continue to raise awareness of technology and help was forthcoming from the Department of Industry, Department of Education and Science and the Manpower Services Commission or MSC. And it was here in the MSC where we find David Allen and Robert Albury. These gentlemen went on a fact-finding tour of the world, meeting with industry, trade unions and academic institutes, before submitting a report back to the government which, well, unsurprisingly, it reinforced the view that raising awareness and understanding of computing should be made a top priority for the country. David and Robert were very well placed for the task, and they were certainly no strangers to the debate. Early in 1979, the BBC's Continuing Education Television Department produced three documentaries exploring the social impact of the microchip. And this was called The Silicon Factor. Germany now has the world's most sophisticated police computer network. At demonstrations, faces are photographed. Computers are now able to put a name to the picture by measuring the distance between the nose, the ear and the mouth. All state agencies will become linked by computers. This was made with the help of David and Robert from the MSC. For the public, it raised as many questions as it answered about a field we were largely ignorant of. But the new questions now being raised were in fact quite positive. Education is empowering and the series encouraged people to progress from asking questions like how will this affect or take away my job and start asking things like what exactly is a micro and how can I be the one to control it? This line of questioning would form the very basis of the Computer Literacy Project. The Computer Literacy Project then was to raise an army of technically astute workers who would drive the nation's factories, warehouses, infrastructure, services and beyond into a future of automation and technological power to inform, educate and entertain as the BBC motto goes with an emphasis on doing this in a hands-on fashion. The principles of computing are after all exactly the same on these new home micros as it would be on a multi-million pound supercomputer. So learning the foundations on a home computer could very well take you all the way to being in charge of the computer you once feared would take your job. A literacy project though, well that wasn't new to the BBC. In the early 70s, the adult literacy campaign helped to get over two million adults reading through a similar scheme of TV programmes to inspire and supporting materials. It was this combination of stimulating media and hands-on exercises that they wanted to replicate with the Computer Literacy Project. All I want is a proper cup of coffee in a proper copper coffee pot. Coffee. Since On The Move began, 70,000 people have come forward for help with their reading or writing. Dillis is one of them. Well, I wanted to read, to learn to read. Most of all, I wanted to spread my married name. Because I just got married, you see, now I can spread my married name, you know. But now I can. <laughs> to be hands-on, though, the project needed a machine that you could lay your hands on. A standard machine for everyone, so that no matter who was inputting the code, typing in the programme, they would get the same, hopefully, gratifying results that would encourage them to continue. The hardware on the UK micro scene was at a turning point in 1980. Until now, there were the expensive trinity of first home computers from the US, the TRS-80, Apple II and the Commodore PET, which well, they didn't really take hold in the UK. And there were the self-assembly kits or instruction guides in amateur electronics magazines, which they required more skills, really, than the average man or woman on the street had. But they were there as an option. But a homegrown microcomputer scene was rising up in the UK. Companies like Sinclair Research and Acorn Computers were starting to produce fully assembled computers sold on the high street at an affordable price. 
Machines like the Acorn Atom and Sinclair ZX80 released in 1980 for 170 and 99.95 respectively, that's UK pounds. Although these were also available still in component form for those who had the skills at a lower price. It was conceivable then that a homegrown micro already existed to offer the affordable hands-on element of the computer literacy project, but which one should be used? Which machine would the BBC be prepared to put its very reputation on the line for? Which machine indeed? Well, the very one on the desk here, of course. So let's take a break from the history lesson to just actually look at it. Something I haven't done since I was at primary school. So it's really interesting for me to look at it now through adult eyes and get a different perspective on it. So here it is, and it's certainly a machine with presence, a sizable thing indeed, which has been built to the specification required of it by the BBC, and it also goes above and beyond that. The Model A and B looked identical. They sold for £235 for the Model A, £335 for the Model B. And as we heard, if you were a school, you got a big discount on that price. I believe it was a 50% subsidy or thereabouts that you got from the government. And the main difference was that the Model A had 16K of RAM as standard and the Model B had 32K of RAM as standard. The Model B, as far as I remember, being the more popular choice. Now, unlike the Sinclair ZX80 or 81 here, which looks like it might snap in half if you dropped your Panda Pop on it, the BBC Micro was designed to withstand the most challenging environment known to computers, the school classroom. It's chunky with thick plastic, similar to the later Acorn Electron, which Acorn claimed was made from the same plastic as police riot shields. The BBC does feel very similar in its build quality. And something you'll notice as you look around the machine is that there are no sliders, knobs or dials to be touched. You're just presented with the keyboard. And that's so nothing could really be fiddled with in that classroom environment. The last thing the teacher wanted was 20 of these turned up to full volume. Because there was audio, there's a speaker grill here for the built-in speaker, but there's no volume dial for that on the outside. You could adjust it on the inside. And while we're on the subject of audio, I'll just show you this very quickly. This is another BBC Micro. And this is a common modification that you might done, have done at home because, as I said, you didn't want to be able to adjust the volume in the classroom. But here is a volume knob fitted retrospectively to the, uh, this is the user ROM port. You would slot in additional ROMs to load programs there. And also three and a half mil speaker jacks have been fitted to both sides. So that was a common modification for the home user. And um, later on in the series, we will pop the lid off and see how that's been done. But as standard, the volume was set inside and the kids couldn't change it. So yes, as you sat to use the BBC Micro, all you were presented with was this big, satisfying keyboard. And I've heard Chris Curry of Acorn say in an interview in recent years, the cost price of that keyboard was something in the region of 25 pounds. It was a little above that, I believe. And that's a sizable portion of the overall cost of the machine. But I think it's money very well spent. It's lovely to type on. You could type on that all day with no problems. The row of red keys along the top there were designed to be software definable, so you could put a piece of paper under the plastic flap at the top here to remind you what each key does for the particular piece of software you were running. And various ports exist around the machine. If I just turn this around here, most interestingly to me are the three, not one, but three video ports on the back here. So you've got UHF, so you could tune your low-cost television into it and use it at home. You've got a bayonet-style adapter there, that's a composite video out. And most interestingly, you've got an RGB video output port there, which not only gives you a lovely crisp image on something like this, the Cub branded monitor. This is the very monitor that I would have had in my school back in the day, and a lovely monitor it is too. But also that was really important for the BBC themselves to capture the output to make the supporting BBC programs for the uh, computer literacy project. So they would capture the video output in a nice crisp, clear way from there for their own TV shows. As we work our way along the ports, we've also got various other things here. An RS-423 port, a cassette port to load from cassettes, an analog joystick port, and then interestingly over here, what's called an Econet port. This machine doesn't actually have an Econet adapter. It's just that the blanking plate has been pushed through by a curious school child's finger, I expect. Uh, but if you had one fitted, that was Acorn's own answer to a, a, a local area network for small businesses or for schools. So you could actually push programs into the computer's memory over a network if you were at one of those affluent schools that had 20 machines 
all hooked up on an eco net and the teacher could press a button and make the programs pop up for you all. I never got to experience that, but we did have disk drives in my school because the cassettes were obviously a little bit too slow loading for the amount of time we had in a lesson. So we had five and a quarter inch floppy disks and they worked just great. And that in fact plugged in to some more ports which are on the bottom. Let's have a look at those. Here is that disk drive port and also a supporting auxiliary power port to power the disk drive. So that was really useful. That reduced the number of plug sockets you needed in the classroom or the office to run the machine with a disk drive. Now the most interesting port for me is the tube port over here. The reason being the machine that the BBC Micro evolved from at Acorn was called the Acorn Proton. That was a prototype to follow up the Acorn Atom. It never went to market because it became the BBC Micro, but that was a dual CPU based machine. So they stripped that back to create the BBC Micro to a single 6502 based CPU in the BBC Micro. But they have the tube port here so you could add a secondary processor. And that didn't have to be 6502 based. You could add a Z80 module and then run things like the CPM operating system. There was even an IBM PC module so that you could load, say, MS-DOS software uh, using this as your main PC with that secondary processor to gain compatibility with that software. And it would route it all through the video port through your main monitor here. It was a really, really flexible machine. More recently, people have created adapters to add a Raspberry Pi to the tube port. So you can actually use the Raspberry Pi's processor to make this thing fly. It's ridiculous how fast you can run, uh, let's say Elite, using a Raspberry Pi as the processor on this thing. And historically, that tube port um, has a really interesting story to tell. It's a story for another time. But Acorn developed a RISC processor, which they tested and ran through the tube port on the BBC Micro. And that RISC processor we know as ARM. Yes, the very same ARM CPU that's in our tablets and our phones in the modern day. So this plays a huge part in the development of the ARM processor. But as I said, that's a story for another day. I'm sure we'll cover it at some point. It's a sturdy machine then, and we've got a lot more to learn about it when we get the lid off later in the series. But on the face of it, you can see why it was built the way it was built. You can understand that it's perfect for the classroom environment. And it was a really nice introduction to computing for people who, for many, this would be their first machine and it didn't confuse them too much. Just presented with them with a keyboard and said, okay, here's the manual, here's the keyboard, see what you can do with it. The question is, why was it chosen? Was the competition any good? Was there a better option out there to be the BBC Micro? I think we should learn a little bit more about that final bidding process and how Acorn won and the Proton became the BBC Micro. Let's find out. The Acorn made BBC Micro then would be the machine for the job. And it came about as a result of a tender process based on the specifications drawn up by the BBC. We've touched on a lot of them just by looking at the machine itself. So above and beyond those requirements of a proper keyboard, an RGB video output and sound capabilities, the machines jostling to be chosen also needed to offer color graphics, which could be easily programmed, and perhaps most importantly, a built-in basic programming language. If you could program, you were considered literate in computers, you spoke the very language that they used, and BASIC was the best entry to learning that skill. Quite the contrast to the point of entry today, where perhaps word processing or spreadsheet skills are considered to be uh, computer literacy, but these were very different times. Anyway, if you combine that BASIC language with commands to easily manipulate sound and graphics, then the student sat at the machine should get some quite pleasing feedback and affirmation that they're making progress. And once they've progressed from those early lessons, they can really get stuck into the meat of the mechanics of programming and continue their computer literacy journey. So how do you find a machine that ticks all of these boxes? Building a new machine from scratch would take years. So the BBC decided to approach companies to see if existing computer prototypes might fit the bill. And six of them responded. One was Newbury, the creators of the Newbrain computer. The BBC's early specifications actually closely matched that of the Newbrain, and some say this was in the expectation that Newbury would tender for and win the contract, a very quick and easy turnaround in a limited time frame. Very convenient and slightly suspicious, but that's not how it played out in the end. British computer boffin Sir Clive Sinclair enters our story at this point. 
yet to be knighted, so he's not a sir yet, but at this point he was involved in the New Brain project. New Brain had started life as a Sinclair radionics project, which was then transferred to Newbury Laboratories when Sinclair Radionics closed. And by this point, Sinclair had decided that he wouldn't actually be able to hit his goal of a sub £100 price point computer. His focus instead then turned to a Z80 CPU based machine over at Sinclair Research where he would achieve that ambitious goal in 1980. Clive Sinclair then would also put forward a machine from Sinclair Research for consideration by the project. In a speech given at the National Museum of Computing by David Allen, the man from the MSC who at this stage had become the computer literacy project editor, he said that by February 1981, the whole process had been whittled down to just three tenders, Newbury, Tangerine and Acorn. And it's a great talk, by the way, I've included a link in the description where you can hear his insights into the project and I do encourage you to go and watch that. At Acorn, it was the prototype machine named the Proton which I mentioned earlier, the successor to their earlier Atom machine, which was in development. And they managed to quickly turn the Proton around to demonstrate it to the BBC, who were suitably impressed when they visited. In the film Micro Men, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, that's a dramatisation of the battle to create the BBC Micro, we see the Acorn team snipping a wire at the last minute to make the prototype work. Chris Curry of Acorn stated in a recent interview that Yes, time was tight, but it wasn't really the bomb defusal style cutting of a wire that has entered urban legend. Again, links to those sources are in the description and do check them out. Conversely, Newbury enthusiastically told the BBC that their prototype was ready to be demonstrated. But when they went to see it, it simply didn't work. Disaster. The new brain would eventually come to market in 1982 by this stage, the design was outdated. It had no sound, it had no color graphics. It didn't trouble the competition and it was in no way ready for the BBC in 1981, let alone the public in 82. Over at Tangerine, details are scarce on their offering. But in an interview later that year in Your Computer Magazine, when the winner had been selected, Paul Johnston, the co-founder of Tangerine, said the following. The BBC approached us and described the kind of computer the series required. We said to them that there was no way they were going to make 12,000 computers to sit on the shelves for January based on their predictions of the market. That figure, 12,000, being the initial run of machines the BBC needed manufacturing by the winning company, based on its estimated demand for this all new singing dance in BBC Micro. In the end then, the Acorn prototype was selected as the winner, and the BBC Micro design was finalised and put into production. Clive Sinclair, who hadn't even made the final cut, was extremely unhappy not to have got the contract, not least because Acorn co-founder Chris Curry had worked at Sinclair for 13 years before leaving to set up a company of his own, and that company would become Acorn. And Sinclair was so prominent in bringing low-cost micros to our homes that um, I imagine it would have been quite a high-profile embarrassment for the man not to have won. Acorn then had pipped them all to the post, and despite Paul's protestations at Tangerine about the need for a whole 12,000 units, the Acorn-produced BBC Micro would go on to sell over 1.5 million units in its lifetime and capture a segment of the UK's education market that a Tangerine could only dream of. That then is only the beginning of learning all about the BBC microcomputer and this great big thing called the Computer Literacy Project, at the centre of which was the computer and school kids like me who had to use them in our primary school. I say had to use them, it wasn't a chore at all. I loved when you turn this on, it makes a boo bip noise and as soon as I heard that, I would rush to the back of the class where the computer was to be the first on it. Now you may be wondering why you haven't heard that yet, why I haven't turned it on. And that's because there's some essential maintenance that must be done on every BBC Micro in this day and age before you switch it on, particularly in the PSU area. If you don't do it, there'll be a big bang uh, and that will be the end of that. Uh, the monitor over here, thankfully, that's in good working order. So in part two, the soldering iron will come out, the lid will come off and we'll learn exactly what's inside this machine. We'll do our maintenance and then we'll continue learning about that computer literacy project. And I'd love to show you some of the programs that I remember from school. Not only the computer programs, but also the supporting TV programs from the project. Um, a very interesting one I remember 
involved racing pigeons. It had a really catchy theme tune. So uh, no doubt, the more I use it, the more memories will come back to me and, and I'm looking forward to sharing them with you. So I hope you join me then in part two uh, and beyond because this will be, I expect, a three-part series. But you never know. We'll see what we unearth along the way. And until then, thank you for watching and take care. If you enjoy my content and would like to toss a coin into the hat to support the cave, then check out patreon.com forward slash retro man cave and join the official cave dwellers you can see on the screen now. Thank you for your support.